from the first book of Samuel, first book of Samuel, and chapter 14. First book of Samuel, chapter 14, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us read. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the, th the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his, his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah, under a pomegranate tree, which is a migron. The people who were with him were six hundred men. Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Seneh. The front of one faced northward, opposite Michmash, and the other one southward, opposite Gibeah. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So his armor-bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, Very well, let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. <coughs> but if they say thus, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Look, the Hebrews are coming out of their, of their holes where they, were, they have hidden. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor-bearer and said, Come up to us, and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor-bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor-bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor-bearer killed them. The first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor-bearer made was about twenty men within about half an acre of land. And there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked, so that it was a very great trembling. Now the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away, and they went here and there. <coughs> then Saul said to the people who were with him, Now call the roll and see who is gone from us. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here, for at that time the ark of God was with the children of Israel. Now it happened while Saul spoke to the priest that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to the battle. And indeed every man's sword was against his neighbor. And there was very great confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews, who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, were also joined. They also joined the Israelites, who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth Aven. Amen. God had led Saul to be at that place 
where the Philistines had assembled to make war against the Israelites. And the, for starters, a multitude of Israelites had followed Saul, but as they saw the Philistines assembling across of them, and then being great in numbers, many Israelites became afraid. They left, others hid in the forest, others hid in the holes, and others went, they crossed the Jordan to the east, to the, to the Mediterranean Sea. But Samuel had given a command. God had given a commandment to Saul. As we had said, last we spoke about this last Monday. He told him to stay and wait for seven days. But last moment, he became afraid, and he lost his faith, and he lost his blessing. And this is the main characteristic of people that God has called them, and He has appointed great blessings and a glorious future for them. But when they lose their patience... And they lose their faith and hope in God, they lose everything. And that is how Saul lost everything. But the fact that God rejected Saul from being king over Israel does not mean that God changes his plan in regard to the people of Israel. So God had appointed a king that would lead the people to victories. Because when God places men, He doesn't place them there so they can be vanquished, but so they can triumph. When God chooses and anoints a person, He doesn't anoint him so he can be crushed and destroyed. But He anoints them so they can be blessed and then glorified. So when God calls a person and man accepts this calling and then God anoints him, and the New Testament is He regenerates him and baptizes him in the Holy Spirit. The plan of God for this person is not His destruction, is not His end, is not His perdition. The plan of God for this person is the infinite blessing of God in his life. That is what He did with Saul, and that is what He did for the people of Israel. Unfortunately, Saul lost the privilege of being a king, but... God did not reject him from leading the people of Israel into victories. So God has appointed victories here. Even with those 600 men that were left with Saul. Because for God it isn't difficult for him to do great things. Great and glorious things with few people. It's not difficult for him. The gospel of Jesus Christ was preached in one generation throughout the whole world and the whole world believed in Jesus and this started from 120 men and women and and more specifically out of, from 10, 12, forgive me, fishermen in general. <laughs> we have to be sure that God has a good plan for us. He has a good plan. Now if we lose our ways if we lose our faith, if we lose our patience and lose our hope, it isn't God's fault. It's definitely our fault. So the penalty for Saul was that his kingdom was taken from him, which at that day, when he, he was going to promise his kingdom to him to forever and ever, to him, his children and grandchildren. But the work of God concerning the destruction of the Philistines would not end there. Their time had come, and that work had to be done. So Samuel departed from Saul. Saul was disappointed. The Israelites were terrified. Six hundred men in total were the ones who were left. And only the, the, the chariots of the enemies were 30,000. And the horsemen were 100,000. And the, the foot soldiers were innumerable. The people of Israel can't do anything. But the question isn't what the people of Israel can then do. The question isn't what people can do. It's what God can do. What can God do now? And God can do everything. So long as He finds one person whose heart is perfect, supported on God, and He has found this person. And this man is Jonathan. God found this man. So Jonathan, who had a companion, 
It was he and Saul, the other ones who had weapons. None of the rest of the people of Israel had weapons. Only Jonathan and only Saul. <coughs> and the weapons of Jonathan were held in the hands of his companion, the armor bearer. But God saw the heart of Jonathan. And Jonathan turned his eyes and his heart toward God. And he made a decision in his heart. He said, we'll go across to the Philistines. If God is with us, he will give him into our hands. If it is his will now for the crush of the Philistines to come, God will do it. But we do not want to go on with our own will because it will lead us to affliction and sufferings. We want to continue and carry on with the guidance of God. And because he had nothing to do at that moment, because they usually ask the Lord through the Ark of the Covenant, he said, we'll place a sign. The sign, placing signs, is the last thing that man uses, the man of God uses for guidance. Especially in the New Testament, now we have the Holy Spirit, we have a living God who speaks to us, and we care about walking with guidance and ruling of the Holy Spirit in our heart, which is acceptable by God. God wants this thing, and it is easy for God to give us this. Furthermore, when God baptizes people in the Holy Spirit, He can speak to them a lot easier. And so, my dear brethren, Jonathan put a sign. He said, we'll go across. If when the Philistines see us, they say, come close to us, then we will go to them because we'll take it as if God is t giving them into our hands. But if they say, stay where you are and we're coming to you, then we'll stop and not go up to them. The main sign, one, another main sign is the that his armor bearer agrees with him, his companion agrees with him completely. This man, when, he, when Jonathan told him what they were going to do, he said, do whatever's in your heart. Go on, I am with you according to your heart. <clears throat> when two people have, when two people agree, there is uh, support in the man of God in this. When there is opposition, though, opposing opinions, then the man of God must stop and think about it. So for that reason, when a man and woman do not agree on something, they should wait. Of course, God says to the woman, submit to your husband. But he also tells his husband, the husband to love his wife. And when he tells him to love his wife, it means that he must do her favor. So he won't be an oppressor and a tyrant, but sensible toward her. He won't be a torturer. But he will be a person who will be careful and pray and observe to see what the will of God is for their life. This is very serious for us to know that on our own, because we want it, this isn't the thing that God wants, most probably. Neither alone can God lead us? Because we all have the Spirit of God. Uh, should God lead us on our own? But we all have the Spirit of God, and we all understand, but especially the people who are close to us. <clears throat> because the people who are close to us, it isn't us who have found them. If we found them, then we're wrong. However, if God has brought them close to us, then we have to take care of them, pay attention to them, and listen to them. What, what's, what does this mean? To be careful and to see, what does this mean? What does that mean? We have to be very careful and very prayful. <clears throat> so when Jonathan saw that the armor bearer, his companion, was in agreement, with words of faith in his mouth, he says, it may be that the Lord will work through for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. <clears throat> so 
So what matters, my brethren, is our faith, but also the agreed opinion, the assurance. It's very important. The agreed opinion. My wife to agree, not to disagree. My brother agrees, he doesn't disagree. The elders agree, they do not disagree. And unity of opinion, there's absolute blessing, there's no doubt about this. So these two, in agreement, they test God in the way that they thought or in the way that God led them, finally. They appeared because there were two big boulders, and among them, they could climb up to the, where the garrison of the Philistines was by climbing up with their hands and feet. So they went up there, and the Philistines appeared, and they said bit, um, amongst themselves, Here are the Jews, and they are coming out of the holes where they had hidden. Here are the Hebrews, and they are coming out where they have been hidden. And so God lays it in their heart, the fulfillment of the sign of Jonathan. Come up to us, they say, and we will tell you something. So there, with great trust, with great trust, Jonathan turns to his armor bearer and he says, Let's go. The Lord has given these uncircumcised into our hands. How? What? They couldn't imagine something. They couldn't think of something. They just did it by faith. They walked by faith. And this is the crucial point. Now here there is an issue, a matter. Man could say, now, by faith I'm going to go and walk in the ways. He'll drown. If his faith is not based on the Word of God. Faith is a very crucial, but also can become dangerous when it is uh, used at, with imagination in the life of man. When it is not in agreement to the Word of God, what is not in agreement with God's will, it turns into uh, a charade. And the name of the Lord is reproached as well. It is not as some people say, I will practice my faith now. That's wrong. I remember once, we were in Asia, my wife tried to practice her faith. She said, Lord, you don't show me any visions or dream. You don't show me anything. What am I going to do now? She was on her knees and she said, Now I'll just exercise my faith. I'll, I'll lift my eyes up and I'll see you standing before me. And so she prayed and prayed and prayed. At that moment, I got up and went to my room. I didn't have a reason to go to the room. I went to the room, and coming back, I saw my wife on her knees. I stopped before her because I wanted to tell her something. And as I was going to stretch out her hand to touch her and talk to her, Anna was full of faith. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see you now. And she lifted her hands, and instead of seeing the Lord, she saw me. And she cried out aloud. They could hear it so patras. I was afraid. I said, what, am I so terrifying that my wife just saw me and, and she was startled? She explained to the, this to us afterward. Of course, this practice of her faith turned into a, a joke. <clears throat> we hear this and we laugh now, but it's a mistake. You cannot practice your faith that way. You either have it or you don't. God, God has given it to you or He hasn't. And faith is an assurance within yourself. A confidence. It's a miracle. First of all, faith is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Natural faith of man, because all people have natural faith. What is natural faith? I'll go into the elevator, and I'm not afraid. I don't worry that I'm going to be locked in the elevator. I know that it will go up. If I don't have this faith, if I don't believe that the elevator works, I don't go in. If we have a plate of food and we say, is it off? Is it good? Is it off? 
we say, oh, forget it, let's not eat it. Why? Because we don't believe it's good. But when you call me to your house and you say, let me give you dinner, I have no doubt, because I have faith that you will give me the best food. You won't give me poison. When I get in the bus, I don't worry about whether the, the driver will crash or not. But I enter the bus with faith and I will reach my destination. This is the natural faith. You know, the lack of natural faith creates psychological problems, creates phobias, like hypo hypochondriac, uh, claustrophobia. These are psychological problems because it is a lack of faith, lack of trust. When this natural faith is turned to the gospel of Christ, is turned to the word of God, then what happens then? then it becomes a faith that saves. This faith saves. You are saved by faith. What does this mean? This natural faith turns to the gospel, turns to Christ, and it says that Jesus Christ saves. I believe it. I trust it. I call upon His name. And Christ comes and saves us. But also, as Christians, when we are born again, we have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is faith. So he, man then believes the gospel. He believes everything. But there are also people that fall short in faith. Or people who have no faith at all. Who is a person who has no faith? The word of God describes him as the wayside. He is the wayside. He doesn't trust the word of God. He doesn't let the word of God enter him. And the devil comes, takes the word of God, and leaves no results. Do you believe that Jesus Christ regenerates? No, then you will never be saved. Do you believe that he, he regenerates? Then He will save you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ will cut the cigarette? Will it make you stop, help you stop smoking? It may not be today, but tomorrow, the day after, He'll help you stop co smoking. Do you believe that Jesus Christ baptized in the Holy Spirit? Then He will baptize you today, tomorrow, the day after. He will do it. Because you ask for it in faith, and He will give it to you, not because you're somebody great, but because you ask for it in faith. And when we ask for something in faith, we receive it. Do you believe that Jesus Christ can heal? Then He will heal you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ will heal you? <laughs> if you believe it, He will do it. But you say, what, me? How can He heal me? If you hesitate, the person who hesitates, let him not think that he will ever receive anything from God. He who hesitates... It's like the waves of the sea that get rough and, and thunder and they go, they are tossed left and right, but they just go forward and backwards. They don't move. They're not like the river. They go up and down. That is how he who hesitates is. And God calls him double-minded and disorderly in all his ways. That is the unbeliever, the double-minded person. And he may save me, may he, he may not. He may he heal me or he may not. But here Jonathan isn't like that. Uh, to Jonathan, a miracle has happened because faith is a miracle. I've told you again, when Alexia was sick and I was praying for her and saying, Lord Jesus, heal her, something happened inside me, something. And I couldn't say, Lord, heal her. I said, Lord, thank you for healing her. My prayer had changed. And at night when we went home, the child was, um, was in a horrible state. <coughs> and Anna said, let's go to the hospital. I said, I'm not going anywhere. The Lord has healed the child. For you to say this, it means that something has happened in your heart. God has spoken to you. God must have assured you of this. So it is different for you to walk in faith, and it is different for you to walk in your fantasy or your opinion. God is with me. I think that I'll manage. You won't manage anything. So faith is a very sensitive part, point, and it has to be based on the Word of God alone. The Bible says the Word of God and the Word of God, uh, the oracles of God. The oracles of God, Rima in Greek, is the personal Word of God. The way that Jesus spoke personally to the, serv to the, to the jail, to the keeper of the jail, he said, Paul said, what, they, he said to Paul, what should I do so I can be saved? And Paul said, believe you and your house shall be saved. That was a personal message for him. But where will God speak to us personally? There will we will go and seek Him. 
For that reason, my dear brethren, the reliable Christians are the Christians who seek God, the spiritual Christians. Those who care about spiritual things and are zealous. When someone says, God told me something, I say, yes, I stop. And I say, okay, yes, tell me what God told you. But if someone who isn't really spiritual tells me God told me, then I say, okay, we'll, we'll see about it. A person who prays, a person who is uh, in Bible studies, who has uh, sanctification and cleanness, God will speak to this uh, man, <coughs> and He will make him confident in what He does. So for that reason, my dear brethren, that is why we want to trust in God, and we want God to trust in us. Not only for us to trust in God, but also for God to trust in us. There are Christians and there are petty Christians as well. There are Christians of uh, the sweet waters and there are Christians who swim in the depths of the ocean. And it isn't for us to examine to see who these people are. We have to look at ourselves to see if we are such people. That is what matters. If I look left and right, I'll just sin because I will, I will just compare myself and become a fool in sin. But if I look at myself, I see the wretched state of myself and repent. And only such a person can see clearly. But if we look left and right, we have a plank in our eye and we can't see clearly. We see a speck in our brother's eye. If you want to see clearly, the Word of God says, take the plank out of your own eye first, and then you see clearly so you can take the speck out of your brother's eye. Because if you cannot see clearly and you go to take the speck out of your brother's eye, instead of taking the speck out, you take his whole eye out. <coughs> so it is necessary for us to have God's vision. Not with words, not to make mistakes continuously, but to walk it with precise footsteps on the footsteps of Christ. And this happens by grace to the humble people, but also to those who seek God. This is a combination of the blessed Christian is, is a combination. First of all, he's humble. He doesn't want to be great and important. He doesn't consider himself to be great and important. He doesn't think that he, everyone else makes mistakes except him. He doesn't believe for himself that he had to be higher in the church or in the world or at his job or in his family. <coughs> but he knows that he knows nothing. He knows that without Christ, how small and insignificant he is. And that's why he goes to Christ. Not like I went to the Lord and said, Lord, make tell my wife to repent and return to me. No. We say, Lord, reveal my w your will to me so I can understand it. Because whoever compels himself to someone else becomes a fool. So the first characteristic is humility. If you do not know how to humble yourself before men and before God, then you cannot win anything. From mistake to mistake you'll go, from error to error. And you always isolate yourself and become less and less um, sociable to the brethren because you don't have a humble spirit. You also have to have a contrite heart, a broken heart that is able to ask forgiveness even when it's not its fault. God forbid if we only ask forgiveness when it's our fault only. Even when it's not our fault, we ask forgiveness. We say we're sorry. It may be the other person's fault. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to examine who's right and who's wrong. If we try to do that, then it's a mistake. We'll, we'll just fall on our face. <coughs> I do not examine whether I am right or you are wrong. What I examine is that God to bless me, and God have compassion in me and mercy upon me because I stumble in many things. Even if I am right at this point and you are wrong, because I stumble in many things, I have to go and ask forgiveness from you also. Uh, we ask sorry, we say we're sorry always when there is an issue 
lingering, we ask forgiveness, always. Like we always forgive, always. A contrite heart and a humble person who is able to forgive. A heart that is able to repent and to ask forgiveness, but also to be able to forgive at all times. But if I'm not humble, I can't forgive. We say, who are you going to tell me what I'm going to do? And the third characteristic is that we tremble before the Word of God. We tremble before the Word of God. Let us not make a mistake. Because if you make mistakes, you'll do harm to yourself and to those who hear you. But if you're careful of yourself and you pay attention to the doctrine, then you will save yourself and those who hear you. And we do not claim that we never make mistakes. Have we understood something? Then we check it out. We check it again. We triple check it. We ask here, we ask there, what do you think, brother? What do you do here, do here brother? But especially, we pray until God comes and puts the assurance in our heart, not to us, but to everyone else as well. To everyone else as well. But don't, don't say, he doesn't understand. Leave him alone. He doesn't understand. Don't say that. He has to understand. He's your brother. <clears throat> if he doesn't understand that now, he will understand later. Because the Word of God says, if someone believes or has the impression of something different, it doesn't matter. <coughs> God will reveal the same thing to him in time. Don't reject him. But pray so that God may reveal it to him. So faith isn't a simple thing. The Word of God, the personal Word of God, the Rima, the personal oracle of God for man, is not a simple thing. There are conditions that are required. You have to have a spirit of a humble person, be humble. You have to have a heart of a contrite person and to truly tremble before the Word of God. This man is reliable. God will come and speak to him and explain to him and reveal his Word to him. <coughs> God does not show partiality. He reveals his truth to everyone. But if God seeks God and he fears him, he has these characteristics, then God says that he reveals his secret things to him who fears God, to his beloved one, and to the person that pleases him. He gives him wisdom and understanding and power and authority, <coughs> the person who pleases God. Now, Jonathan is such a person, but Saul is not. <coughs> but it is Jonathan and his armor bearer that, that are these type of people. And here's the miracle that will happen. What, what miracle? As soon as Jonathan and his armor bearer show themselves, immediately they fell before Jonathan. Jonathan doesn't have weapons because he climbed, climbed up with his two hands. They fell before him. This isn't happening for the first time. This has happened before. If we go to the Gospel according to John, <coughs> Chapter 18 and verse 4. <coughs> Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Who are you seeking? This is in the, in the Garden of Olives, when Judas was bringing the mob to arrest him. And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. They fell down on the ground. The presence of God is amazing. So when Jonathan appeared, the Philistines fell before Jonathan. And the armor-bearer the one who carried the weapons of Jonathan, when they had fallen down, he would kill them one after the other after him. Jonathan would walk, they would fall, and uh, the armor bearer would kill them. And this is the first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made. And it was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. <clears throat> but it's not only that. God started now. 
with miracles, so he will continue with miracles. And that is how God works. With miracles, he works. With power and might. With powers that are above nature. And there was trembling in the camp, in the field. And among all the people, fear and trembling came upon them. And the garrison and the traders also trembled. And the earth quaked so that it was a great term trembling. <coughs> all the camp of the Philistines, 30,000 uh, chariots, innumerable foot soldiers were terrified with the terror of God. And it says in verse 20, and then every man's sword was against his neighbor and there was a very great confusion. So in their battle, they be in their confusion, they started slaughtering one another. And this is what God can do. And it isn't the first time. God had done that earlier during the time of Judges with Gideon. When with 300 men, he did not go up to fight them, but he just lit a light. Fear of God entered them and the Midianites, because they were the enemies back then, they started killing one another, and none of them were left. <clears throat> but again, this wasn't the first time. In Babel, again, God confused their tongues, and one could not understand the other man's tongue. This is God's judgment. What is, what is this God's judgment? It is confusion. Wherever you see confusion... There, there is God's judgment upon that place. There is Babel. <coughs> Differences. There, God has poured out His judgment. There, God has intervened. You see a woman and wife, they fight and fight and fight and fight and fight. Leave, leave, leave. God isn't there with them. They fight all the time. Don't get confused. Don't, get, don't mingle with them. For them to have differences without fighting. Then try and go and bring peace. But if they fight continuously, God is not among them. When I see such situations, I turn. I curb. I say, no. First they have to clean their lives. First they have to sanctify themselves. First the presence of God must come in their life. And then I'll go. How can I go there and fight with the devil? There's confusion. There's war. And the war, you will also be wounded. So no, don't go to fights. When you see a church fighting, uh, having uh, divisions between us, there's judgment of God. When there's a family that's fighting amongst themselves, there's God's judgment there. God isn't a God of, of, uh, of fighting and, and <clears throat> divisions. He's a God of order. He's a God of love. He's a God of comfort. A God of compassion and mercy. He is not a God of confusion. God brings confusion, especially upon the proud, but also upon sinners, but also his enemies as well. <clears throat> but let us return again. It was the first slaughter, 20 men in that region, the armor bearer of Jonathan slaughtered as in a, a Jonathan passed by and the Philistines were falling before him. So fear and trembling, imagine this, a man is walking and people fa fall around him. Everyone was terrified by this, that God is there, they must have said. <coughs> and when we say everyone, we're talking about a thou thousands of people, myriads of people. And from a fall, Saul saw that the multitude was, was dissipating. Look at this, my dear, from, from two people. This is what God can do with two like-minded people. For that reason, the Apostle Paul says, I have no one else like-minded except you, Timothy. And wherever he went, wherever Timothy and Paul went, God would open doors for them, and great signs and wonders took place. For that reason, my dear brethren, it is necessary for us to become like-minded. And who is a like-minded person? And there are two words in Greek, isopsychi and homophrenes. Isopsychi is those who, have, who seek not their own, but of Jesus Christ. 
For example, I and my wife, so we can be soft psyche to have the equal soul, is not what the best thing for us, for our children is, but to seek the will of God. You know what God will do with these two people? He'll do great things. Be careful of quer quar of divisions and fighting, quarrels. Quarrels are not from God. <coughs> A problem lies in quarrels. You have to humble yourself. You have to repent. You have to ask forgiveness from one another and ask forgiveness from God. We won't have a good future if we quarrel. We won't have a good continuance. We have to be beloved, my brethren. We have to love one another. And we said the union of the Spirit comes by enduring one another in love, suffering one another in love with the bond of perfection which is love. That is how unity will come. And it is necessary so that we may walk in this Christian life. <coughs> Saul saw from afar that the garrisons were, the, were, were, were scattered. The enemies were being scattered. He said, what's going on? Look around. Take a roll. Is anyone live, uh, missing? And from the 600, two men were living, m missing. Jonathan and the armor bearer. He didn't know what to do. He called the Ark of the Covenant and said, let's pray. But he saw the, that the, uh, the enemies were scattering. But he said, forget about it. Now let's go attack them. <clears throat> and when they arrived, they saw a great slaughter taking place. One was slaying the other. We cannot play with God, my brethren. You cannot mock God. If you sow in the flesh, you will reap corruption. If you sow in the Spirit, you will reap eternal life. Not only for yourself, but also for those who hear you. And the flesh is the ways of the flesh. I want to make myself handsome, make me myself pretty, and uh, be more modern to be distinguished and to be great, the women to color their faces a bit and to color their hair and put some lipstick and this and that. Let me bring the shirt further down and uh... Why? For who? Why, why do you do this? For whom should you do this? It's definitely not the Lord. Do you sow in the flesh? Don't expect to reap eternal life. You will reap corruption. My dear brethren, the Word of God isn't strict. Neither am I strict. I'm afraid. I fear God. <clears throat> I want to see my brethren, my family, my church, in sanctification and in blessing. We will give an account to God. So you saw things happening. Why didn't you speak? I don't want God to tell me that. I don't want to become like Saul. For God to tell me, get out of the way, I have someone better than you. No, I don't want to become like Saul, my brethren. Do you want us to become like Saul? We don't want to become like Saul. We want what God says, us to continue in that. And if we make a mistake, God will correct it. We do not claim that we are without error. Of course, we've stated this many times. Neither are we the great teachers. Nor are we theologians. No. What are we? We are all disciples, and we learn all together the Word of God. I will tell you, and you will tell me. And if we make a mistake, we'll all correct it together. We have no intention of enforcing our opinions. Our intention is for the Word of God to be enforced on all of us, for us all to submit to the Word of God. What else? Well, why should we become, become leaders and rulers of whom? If I become the leader of you, so what? What type of leader can I become? I don't want to become a leader. And what can I do as a leader or a ruler? May God keep us. We will all be servants, my brethren. Servants of one another. But with seriousness and sanctification. Well, from then on, things changed completely. There were Israelites who were traitors who had gone with the Philistines. When the Philistines... When they saw the Philistines slaughtering, killing themselves, they went with Saul. There were Hebrews who were hiding in the, in the mountains. As soon as they saw the Philistines being vanquished, they came out as well. And a great blessing happened then. And during that day, it says the Lord saved Israel. During that day, in one day, <coughs> 
with a king who he alone would have been king because his kingdom had left from his hand. He would be king on his own. But God found Jonathan, and with Jonathan he did great things. And may it be that God finds many Jonathans from among us, but also no Saul's from among us. Amen.